live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks for coming out this Thursday night. What's well, been a little bit of a gray, rainy day, but ancient creatures hold no one back, do they? They don't care if it's raining or not, do they? You know what? Hold on. Give me 10 seconds, because I think, yeah, that's definitely like 80s rock and roll playing over the top of my introduction. So I'm going to fix that. Unless you just want me to turn it up and we'll turn it into a party. No votes for that? Everybody's here for the science? Oh, I like this crowd. We could listen to rock and roll, or we could learn about life before the dinosaurs. Thanks for putting up with that, y'all. Yeah, welcome to the Daily Planet Cafe for our Thursday night science cafe. Our guest tonight uh, is in-house with the museum. His name is Dr. Christian Kammer. He's right there. And, yes, uh, he's the research curator for paleontology for the museum, and he's relatively new. How long? He's been with us for about a year. I was actually, I got to host Christian when he gave the talk that got him hired, because you have to do that here at the museum. I had to host a talk in order to get my job. He had to host a talk, get his job. It both worked out. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> yes, I'm taking full credit for this guy's brilliance. No, 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 no. Now, since he's been here, um, we've had the opportunity with the sort of events and education groups here at the museum to work with Christian a lot. So this guy's passion for actually getting his science, his paleontology, out to the public to let us know what he's working on here in the museum and indeed all over the world uh, is amazing. It's incredible stuff because I think he knows more than anybody about anything. Like, he says that he knows, like, a couple things about everything, but I haven't found a subject to ask him about yet where he hasn't known more than I did. Like, and I've even asked him about lemur stuff. And regulars to the cafe know I know a lot about lemurs, and we were just up here talking about lemurs and genetics and DNA, and all of a sudden I was learning something. So, of course, that's the point of the Science Cafe. So I'm really excited for tonight because I've already been learning things, just chatting. So I know you're going to learn something, and I know tonight's going to be a great night. So let's learn about life before the dinosaurs from Christian Kammer. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. And, th and thank you all for coming. Um, I did get my start working on fossils from Madagascar, so I have a bit of an in with lemur stuff. So don't, don't feel too bad there. Um, so yeah, I am the paleontologist uh, at the museum, or the curator, and I actually do not work on dinosaurs, so, okay, none of you left, that's great. Um, so I work on the animals that lived before them, and you might think, oh, okay, you've got maybe like prehistoric fish and various types of bugs, what's actually before the dinosaurs? Um, and as odd it may, as it may seem, the creatures that sort of ruled the earth prior to the dinosaurs uh, were the ancestors of things like us, so the mammals. So mammals are currently one of the most diverse group of vertebrates on the world, certainly in terms of the morphological diversity. There's a huge amount of things that mammals do. They fly, they swim, they burrow, they climb trees. Uh, they, some of them are very small. Some of them are, as far as we know, the largest animals ever to have lived. Um, so currently, there's a lot of diversity in mammals. Also, mammals are very distinctive. I think all of us, if they saw a mammal, they'd be able to recognize it. So if you see something that is fuzzy, that has fleshy ears, something that is warm-blooded and producing milk, you can tell, okay, that's a mammal. If something has scaly skin. Um, if it's cold-blooded, this is a reptile. So nowadays, it's really easy to tell the difference between a mammal and a reptile. But if you go back into deep time, uh, not just thousands of years ago, not just a few million years ago, but actually hundreds of millions of years ago, um, into the Paleozoic era, so before the Mesozoic age of the dinosaurs, things become a lot less clear. So if you look at this highly scientifically accurate assortment of fossil organisms, 
Um, these are things that would be sold as dinosaurs, but in fact, one of them is not a dinosaur. It is this one right here. So the sailback Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur. It's a type of thing called a synapsid. So synapsids, they are these ancestors of mammals, these proto-mammals. They were the first successful amniotes. So amniotes are all the vertebrates, all the things with bony uh, spines that live fully on land. So they have a hard-shelled egg, and they never have to go into the water to breathe like a frog or a salamander. Uh, they fall into two major groups, um, of which you have the diapsids, which are the reptiles and the birds, and then the synapsids, which today are just the mammals. Um, but as you will see in the deep past, there were a bunch of other synapsids as well. Uh, and just to very quickly, something I always do to orient people with diapsids versus synapsids, since these are not super common terms. Um, oh, okay, is that better? All right. Um, it's, uh, so the names refer to the number of holes in the skull. So diapsids, they always have, ancestrally at least, some of them are modified. They always have two holes in the skull. So diapsis from ancient Greek, meaning just two holes, synapsid with one hole there. And so all synapsids have that single synapsid opening. And these are attachment sites for the jaw muscles. And so this is retained even into their descendants today, the mammals. Um, let's see here. Yeah, great. Um, so these, uh, if you see that guy in the upper right, that's Dimetrodon, that's that sailback guy from the dino toys, um, and it has that one synapsid opening. If you look at a human skull, you won't see the synapsid opening because our brains have become so freakishly large that it's crowded the jaw muscles out of the back of the skull. But we still have that opening. There's a slight depression just behind your temple. So if you go from like the side of your brow towards your temple, you'll feel that there's a depression there. So that's your synapsid opening. And indeed, our jaw muscles still are up there. It's just that our jaws are very weak compared to something like a chimp or a gorilla that is constantly crunching through, uh, you know, leaves and sort of very high fiber vegetation and things like that. Um, so we have optimized our skull for, for brain size rather than bite force. Um, but we still do have that s evidence of our synapsid ancestry. Um, but this is, when it comes to the deep time animals, is very rarely recognized. And these proto-mammals are almost always thought of as reptiles and usually thought of as dinosaurs. Um, but they are closer to you and me than they are to any dinosaur. And indeed, even when you're thinking temporally, when you're thinking about deep time, we are closer in time to Tyrannosaurus rex today than these proto-mammals like Dimetrodon were to any dinosaur. So they're that far back. Um, what they do show, so their fossil record is excellent. There's th literally thousands of fossils of these proto-mammals. And what they show in quite exquisite detail is the transition from a very reptile-looking thing, something not dissimilar to Dimetrodon, uh, through their evolutionary history to mammals today in all sorts of little features having to do with the origin of all those classic mammalian characters uh, like fleshy, complex ears, uh, occluding multiple forms of teeth, um, warm-bloodedness, all of these features you get to see throughout the synapsid fossil record. Um, and we really do have this lovely transition uh, from reptilian to mammalian grade synapsids. Uh, however, I should note, just as an aside, that this isn't sort of a direct linear transition. Um, that's not how evolution works. So these animals were not sort of striving to become mammals. Uh, selection favored mammalian characters, but there are also all these weird side branches that have nothing to do with the origin of mammals. And instead, they were very successful uh, for their time, but they all went extinct, and mammals are the only ones left. Um, and just to sort of quickly show you some of the, the really weird ones of this, because some of these Paleozoic creatures, I think, are some of the strangest vertebrates that have ever lived. Uh, so just some highlights of synapsid diversity. You have things like the caseids here, which one, are one of my very favorite groups of animals. Um, these are, they started out very lizard-like, but as they went through their evolutionary history, the body kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the skull stayed the same size. 
So you end up with this 16 foot long, enormously bulky herbivore that has a skull about the size of a softball. So, and if you look there, there's a complete skeleton perfectly articulated to the left. So it's not a case where scientists just messed up and put the wrong head on the wrong body. They really are that tiny. Um, with that said, this animal, these caseids, they are the most common herbivores of their day. When you go to those middle Permian rocks where they're found around 270 million years ago. So clearly they were doing something right. Um, but we, it's very difficult to tell what that was. Um, closer to mammals, you have this group, the dinocephalians, which aptly means terrible heads. So these are, have a you know, combination of horns and tusks and sort of antlers and flanges and something like a steminosuchus here, basically any sort of protuberance you can imagine sticking off a skull, they had it. Um, they also have very weird teeth that sort of curve in on each other inside the mouth. Uh, these were also big herbivores. That animal is roughly hippopotamus size, also I should say. Um, and then you have the most successful uh, of all the proto-mammals, the Dicynodonts. These, uh, this group is known from the thousands. Uh, indeed, in the earliest Triassic, one genus of Dicynodont, Lystrosaurus, uh, seems to have made up 90% of all sort of land vertebrate life on Earth. So after there was a mass extinction and most things died out, but it was great for Lystrosaurus. Um, so if you go to early Triassic sediments, you will find, you know, again, thousands of Lystrosaurus specimens, hundreds of them really before you find any other fossils. But Dicynodonts, they were these sort of like pig-like creatures that had lost almost all of their teeth except for a pair of tusks, and then instead got a turtle-like beak uh, where the teeth of most other animals would be. So they were, they were herbivores as well and very good at what they did. Um, and they lasted you know, nearly 100 million years. So most of the fossils of these synapsids have been found in the Karoo Basin in South Africa. And that's because two thirds of the total land area of the country of South Africa is covered in rocks of the Permian and Triassic age. So it's just, there's nothing particularly special about that site. It's just sort of geological happenstance that that much of rocks of the right age are still around there today. Um, so we don't, for Permian, for example, we don't have any Permian rocks here on the East Coast, so we don't go looking for Permian synapsids, um, although the Triassic is a different story. Um, but because so many of these synapsids are found in South Africa, it has given synapsid researchers like myself what I consider to be a very biased view of the fossil record. So while we have this wonderful, complete transitional sequence from these reptile-like proto-mammals to modern mammals, um, we only know what's going on really sort of at a few places around the world. And we want a global view if we are really to understand what's going on with mass extinctions, what's going on with the distribution and the dispersal of these animals. Um, and so to do that in recent years, uh, researchers like myself have been very actively trying to push outside of just looking at South Africa. We still do a lot of work there just because the fossils are so rich and there's so much left to be done. Um, but we've really been trying to go to other localities worldwide. So just to cover a few of those quickly, um, South America is very understudied. And a lot of this is just because there, until you get down to Patagonia or into the Andes, there isn't much exposed rock. So we paleontologists are totally reliant on basically rock being at the surface for us to find fossils. We don't have any technology, no satellite imaging that allows us to see a fossil. How we go and find fossils is really just to go out to mountains and deserts and places like that and walk around until we see one on the ground. That's all there is. Um, so when you look at a place like you know the Amazon basin, or this is the very nearby Parnaiba basin in northeasternmost Brazil, and it looks like this, and it's tropical rainforest, you might think that's a very bad place to find fossils. And indeed, historically, that is the case. That's why people have not worked there. Um, however, uh, the people there are very active at quarrying deep down under the forest in order to produce building stone. Um, and so the, the folks are out there in really brutal temperatures. So it is always 100 degrees or more while we're there. It's cracked 120 while I've been there. Um, you're almost uh, two degrees south of the equator, so the radiant energy of the sun is also very intense. You burn within minutes if you're not totally covered. Um, 
So, you know, I have huge amount of respect for the folks who are out there, most of them barefoot, just hammering uh, scavenged pieces of rebar into the ground to uh, pop out these blocks. Um, but what that does is it brings rock to the surface, rock that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And within that rock, it turns out our fossils. And so for the past six years, um, myself and some of my international colleagues have been down uh, in this part of Brazil looking at some of the earliest record of this you know, reign of proto-mammals from the early Permian um, around 280 million years ago. Um, this is not easy field work, so in addition to the heat, uh, it's the tropics, so it's very buggy. So one of the sites that we work in is called the Motuka Formation. Uh, Motuka is the local word for horsefly, and indeed, when you get to the site, even before you open the door, you'll see six or seven horseflies just along the side of the window. Um, so we always have to be careful of that. Um, also, this is where we have the largest and most painful ants in the world. So there is the dinosaur ant, Dinoponera, and then the bullet ant, Paraponera. Um, both are quite common in the sites that we work. Um, Bullet ant has been described as having the most painful sting of any insect. Uh, one of our student assistants made the unfortunate decision to s test this when we were down there this past month. And despite, you know, practically trying to restrain him, he would not be, not be talked down. At, you know, it's the machismo culture. And sure enough, he was just instantly on the ground, weeping, just like rocking back and forth for a good 20 minutes after this ant stung him. Um, it really is supposed to be like getting struck by lightning. Uh, I, I have not tested it myself, nor do I intend to. Um, but yeah, they're, they're down there, so you have to be careful of that. Uh, so those ants are very painful, but they, they don't hurt you. Uh, what we do have to be careful of in any paleontological work, but especially in some of these tropical areas, are scorpions. Uh, this is the Brazilian fat tail yellow scorpion, um, which is the most venomous in the Western Hemisphere, quite common at these localities. So we always have to be sure to flip the rocks that we're looking under, not to just stick our hands under there, but actually to take our, our rock pick and flip them over, because you never know one of these is, is, is gonna be underneath. Um, and I've known that for years, and I'm always very careful of scorpions. What I did not know until this very year, this trip, is that these things are also up in the trees lurking overhead. And I thought that we had an agreement, the scorpions and I, that they would, they would stay under the rocks, and I would let them go about their life, and you know let them scuttle away when I'm trying to find fossils but that you know, when I'm chilling out in the hammock at night next to the fire, they wouldn't be like raining down from above. So they haven't rained down yet, but I'm, I'm watching them. Um, so ticks are omnipresent. This is a small sampling of the ticks that I collected at the site this year. Uh, so we just went around with sort of this masking tape and went, just went like pop, 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 around sort of the campsite where we were sleeping. I was killing around 100 a day, uh, logged over 1,000 ticks killed at our campsite by the end of the trip. Um, so these ones, they don't have like Lyme disease or anything, but they do carry capybara hemorrhagic virus, which is a, it's a virus that is native to the world's largest rodent, the semi-aquatic capybara, which lives down there. Um, and it's fine when it's in those, these giant sort of rat-like creatures. But once it gets into humans, you start bleeding out of your, your throat and nipples until usually death occurs. So we're trying to avoid any you know, transmission of that as well. Um, even the caterpillars are also quite venomous. <laughs> so these are all uh, caterpillars from the area, some of which are quite beautiful, but that are covered in urticating hairs or spines. Uh, that will inject you with venom if you, if you try to hold them. So even the fluffiest looking ones there actually are quite venomous. Um, finally, uh, within all these bugs, they, it's, it's actually wonderful as a naturalist because you get to see sort of the full breadth of nature um, going on. So even within these bugs that you're afraid of, uh, you know, big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them and all that stuff. Um, so you can see this is a case of a parasitoid worm, a horsehair worm, um, and so let's see, just showing the video of this if that's okay. So yeah, so this is a parasitoid, which means that it grows inside the body of an insect, in this case a cockroach, and then it lethally bursts out of the cockroach's anus um, and goes to 
wriggle around and then lay its eggs, which will eventually be hatch into larvae that are eaten by more insects, and the cycle continues. So a parasite is something that lives inside of other life forms and feeds on them, but doesn't, usually doesn't kill them. Parasitoids grow up inside another organism and do kill them. So you think about the wasps that live inside of caterpillars and then burst out at the end. These worms do the same thing, but for cockroaches. Um, so, okay, that was a bit of a digression. Let's get back to the fossils. So the fossils from these sites, it's worth all that stuff because the fossils are great. This is something that you, this is like just one of the blocks that we found. We have not altered this at all in this photograph. You just look down and find there is perfectly split half of a fish. So if you look here, here's the eyeball of the fish. Here's its little fin there. Here are the scales down along the side. This has sort of a low slung mouth like this. So it looks a lot like a sort of a jack or a dory would today. Um, very, very tall body. So this would have been sort of a, probably a reef type fish or something living in very, very close uh, topologically complex environments. Um, so we also find things like this is a complete skull, uh, just also just as it was found of a prehistoric amphibian, so a salamander-like creature. Um, and you can see actually this is once we prepare it out, it's this beautiful sort of like really classic bone white uh, shading to the skeleton there, and it's in this, this reddish or purplish surrounding rock, so the bone shows up really nicely. You can see all the little, little teeth along the top here, so again there's the eyeball there, and then the jaw going up that way. So it, all of these things are new species. So basically, when you go to some, a fossil site that people haven't worked before, everything you find is new, which is great. So these are just a few of these new amphibians that we've described in the past few years, uh, how we think they would have looked like when they were alive. Um, so we didn't find initially that many of the proto-mammals there, but actually just this year, after looking for six years, we found the first, first proto-mammal fossils at this site. Um, and so these are just, right now, just vertebrae and bits of the jaw, um, but we know that they are there. And so when we go back, probably either next year or the year to come, we're expecting to find a lot more of them now that we know what site they're at. So yeah, there's really a lot of, a lot of promise in this Brazilian locality. Um, to quickly go to the other side of the Earth in almost opposite conditions. So I've also been doing work lately in a site called Kotelnich, which is in Russia, just west of the Ural Mountains. Um, and so here, it is somewhat similar to Brazil in that there isn't rock at the surface. This is also a sort of an underrepresented site. Um, but there, these rivers, they cut through fossiliferous rock. And so along the river bank, when the river is low enough, you can see fossils sticking out. So here, this is in July, which is the only time the river is low enough to find fossils, and it's still very cold. Um, this is probably this day, I think, in the high 40s or so. Um, and you ha to get to the site, you actually, oh, also very buggy, I should say. So this is the opposite condition. In, if you've ever been to Alaska or northern Canada in the summer, these boreal forests uh, are the so kind of, again, the opposite condition from what you have going on in Brazil. In Brazil, there's bugs all the time just because it's always hot. Nothing's there to kill them um, other than, you know, other insects. Um, whereas in the Arctic and sort of the subarctic areas, Insects can really only be out for a month or two of the year because it's frozen all the rest of the time. So if you're an animal like a mosquito, what you do is basically stay in a larval or a pupal form for 10 months, and then you grow into the, the feeding adult and just go bonkers for two months. And so there are billions, I think it was estimated like even a trillion mosquitoes come out during the summer months, and they just cover the landscape trying to exsanguinate every elk, bear, and reindeer they can find, or foolish paleontologists who have decided to go up into that region to look for bugs. So, oh, look for insects, uh, look for fossils, excuse me, and find n almost nothing but bugs. Um, so you also, you have to take a boat to get out there. Uh, so we take these uh, little inflatable uh, zodiac type boats and go from, there's a nearby village that has a little dock and we hop in these and then we'll go like 12 miles upriver uh, in order to get to the few exposed banks that have the fossils. Um, it's easy enough to get out there, it's a lot more difficult when we're trying to bring a giant massive rock back because then it's sort of like the, 
fox, goose, cabbage scenario. We can't all go on the boat at once, it will sink. So we need to sort of figure out what group of people is going to accompany the rock and actually take that back to the port and then send it back until we can get everyone safely home. Um, but the fossils that we find here also are quite spectacular. So these, and also these are mostly new species. So these are two, uh, two new species of saber-toothed predatory proto-mammals from the late Permian uh, that I discovered at this site uh, and which myself and my Russian colleagues named earlier this year. So these are sort of wolf-sized predators uh, that we have reconstructed as looking like this. So this is hunting another, another one of these small little proto-mammals that's living up on the tree there. And this is actually interesting because it shows that these, uh, some of these things had evolved saber teeth long, long before anything that you think about like a saber-toothed tiger, and that this morphology has actually shown up time and time again throughout the history of sort of the synapsid lineage. And interestingly, you don't really see that in reptiles. There aren't really saber-toothed reptiles, but synapsids all throughout their history just do it again and again. There's a real sort of developmental predilection towards it. Uh, finally, just to wrap up here before we start talking about some questions, there's, I wanted to uh, talk about one other sort of non-traditional proto-mammal hunting site, um, which is, so if you look at the amount of Triassic outcrop in North America here, um, it's pretty patchy, but there's this band of the green Triassic rock so uh, along the East Coast. And the southernmost bit is actually right here. So if you look, this is the Newark supergroup. This is Triassic and Jurassic, so the first two parts of the age of dinosaurs. Um, these are rocks that extend from Nova Scotia and then down here in North Carolina in what's called the Deep River Basin, so which is that black uh, patch at the base there. Um, so, and what's best about this for me, as someone who works at North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, is that the the sort of the hotbed of deep river fossils is right in the research triangle. So these fossils are found in Durham and just south of Raleigh, and then also some of them a little further west. So if you, if you were to go, this is me walking around uh, at a site just on the border, just on, a, on the border between uh, uh, Wake and Chatham counties, and here is a nice little complete skull of one of these proto-mammals. And so we try to go out there as, as much as possible uh, this in somewhat uh, nicer times weather-wise. was out there with our collections assistant and digging up all sorts of things. This is the skull, just one skull of a proto-mammal that would have been around the size of a hippopotamus uh, that we're actually still excavating out there, although we have the skull in my laboratory now. So what do these animals look like? So there's some of these, this is what, what we call colloquially the toilet seat head amphibians. These are roughly 15 foot long prehistoric relatives of frogs and salamanders. Um, there's this group, the phytosaurs, which looks a lot like crocodiles, but they are not crocodiles. It's just total convergent evolution. Um, they were actually the crocodiles sort of before crocodiles. So at the time, as I'll show you in a bit, crocodiles were these little whippet-like creatures. Um, and if you're thinking about a, a big semi-aquatic, long-snouted, fish-eating predator, it's these animals, the phytosaurs. And then, of course, these wonderful proto-mammals. These are the ones that are most closely related to mammals and include their, their direct ancestors, the cynodonts. So this sort of thing, it really is blurring the line between sort of a proto-mammal and a mammal proper. And our collection is just full of them. We have hundreds of specimens now of these, these things, almost all of which still need to be described. And so that's what I'm actually very busy with right now is going through our own collections from the Triangle area and describing all of these, these new proto-mammal fossils. Um, however, they are not by far uh, not the only things uh, that are roaming around at this time. So you increasingly in the late Triassic are seeing these big reptiles in the crocodile and dinosaur lineages. So these are early crocodiles. Here's the Carnifex, the so-called Carolina butcher, which is a nine foot tall, possibly bipedal uh, carnivorous crocodile ancestor from this area, and then these smaller ones, these more sort of like greyhound or whippet sized type things. Um, and it's not coincidental that we start to see more and more reptiles at this time because the earth is becoming a lot more arid in the Triassic. So synapsids had the great misfortune for as successful as they were to be living at the time of two of what are called the big five mass extinctions. So in earth history there are five times when the loss of life on Earth has been so major 
that it, it goes beyond sort of mere background extinction and is mass extinction. So there's only five of these, although arguably we're now in the sixth. Um, but synapsids got hit by two of them, the end Permian event and then the end Triassic event. So at the end of the Permian, you get, this is the absolute worst, maybe up to 80 or 90% of species on Earth went extinct at this point. And so all those disonodonts and you know, the dinocephalians, all the really weird ones, most of them go extinct then. And then again, in the Triassic, at the end there, you lose um, sort of a lot of the remaining synapsids. And that is the real transition between synapsid-dominated ecosystems and then by the Jurassic, dinosaurs are basically the only game in town. So thankfully for us, a few synapsids did squeak by almost literally. And these, these are these mouse-sized or shrew-sized mammals, true mammals at this point, that are mostly burrowing, um, that are sort of like scampering around below the feet of the dinosaurs and sort of patiently waiting their turn for the asteroid to come. Uh, and so when the dinosaurs, well, the non-bird dinosaurs at least, do bite it at the end of the Cretaceous, then the synapsids come roaring back with all their amazing modern diversity, ourselves included. Um, but it was, it looked very, very iffy for them for quite a while there. So they've had, they've had some, some ups and downs throughout their history. Um, but really, there's sort of an, an arc of, of synapsids from before the dinosaurs to like sort of hiding out uh, all the way to today. And so with that, uh, I'll end sort of my presentation and start to like, yeah, talk, talk to all of y'all. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. So yeah, let's chat about proto. Yeah, there's already hands going up. That's that's the way it should be. Uh, I'll bring a microphone to you if you've got questions. So as we go along, just try to flag me down as best you can, and I'll bring a microphone over to you. And we've got a lot of time for questions. So I'm seeing more hands. Okay, good. I'm gonna start right here. So one of the, the things you said, and actually in closing, you came back to it, is that the mammals and proto mammals. Um, were somehow evolutionary, ver evolutionarily very successful. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could um, give us some summary of what made them so successful. Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So the, uh, there are a few things that sort of set the proto-mammals apart, and mammals especially. So they have a lot they have better posture and more complex sort of chewing capability than the other animals that were alive at the time. Um, so I mentioned that some of these are losing their teeth, but also some of them are getting much more complex teeth. So these animals are, have evolved the ability to really properly chew their food. So most of the reptiles that were alive at the time, and if you think about plant-eating reptiles today, something like an iguana, what it will do is it has these leaf-shaped teeth on the side of its mouth, and it will snip off leaves and basically swallow everything whole. And then just has to wait for gut microbes uh, in the intestines to ferment that food. Um, and you know it's not hugely efficient. So mammals, they can do all sorts of things like they can start digestion in the mouth. They can chew all these things. You can have something like cattle that you know actually have multiple phases of the digestion where they, they chew it in the mouth, they put it in the stomach, they bring it back, they chew the cud. Um, all of this can be traced back to these muscular, uh, attached to that synapsid opening, and dental innovations of the early synapsids. Um, so when you get to the transition in the Triassic, uh, the great thing that set them apart seems to have been warm-bloodedness. So these animals uh, were a lot more metabolically active than the surrounding reptiles, so they could be awake at night, essentially. So they weren't reliant on the sun's energy uh, in order to move around like most reptiles are. There are, of course, nocturnal reptiles today, but they're usually in the tropics because it's hot all the time for them. Um, but with these early mammals and some of the proto mammals, you know, they're, it, it can be cold, it's night, and that's when they're out feeding. So they can be in their burrow during the day when the dinosaurs are tromping around, um, nice and safe and hidden. And then when the reptiles are asleep or are torpid, they can come out and do whatever they want. So yeah, so chewing innovations and then warm bloodedness, I think, are, are two of the major major points in mammals' favor throughout their history. So I was interested in the evolution of fossil study and what more you learn or can tell today than could be told years ago. 
Um, and you see renderings of images of of dinosaurs and things like color, mm -hmm. um, or the question about have you been able to look at vocal structures to know what they might sound like, and so more recent things that are maybe superficial, but how, how has fossil study evolved? Well, we, we, it seems like every week there is some major new discovery in the life appearance of fossil organisms in general. So a lot of that stuff is in dinosaurs. Um, so thanks to these dinosaurs preserved with feathers in China, um, we have been able to do microscopic and chemical analyses of dinosaur feathers to figure out what color they were. Um, so we now know fairly convincingly, I think it's up to four or five dinosaurs what color they were, which if you told me as a kid that one day would know what color the dinosaurs were, I would not have believed you, but that's where we are. Um, also, the are starting to find things that are, are rarely preserved in the fossil record. Um, so things like the syrinx, which is the uh, equivalent of a bird's voice box. So we know when birds first were able to sing. Um, and because before the syrinx, you know, these things are vocalizing, but they can't sing like modern birds do. That's tied to this one particular organ slash bone that they have. Um, so dinosaurs, they could have been clattering, you know, their jaws together or bellowing like alligators but they weren't singing. Um, neither so pterodactyls, which are more distantly related to dinosaurs, also were not chir chirping like birds. Um, so that's all within sort of the dinosaur side of things. Um, with the proto-mammals, unfortunately, we have very little to go on. So despite the you know, really excellent preservation of a lot of these things, um, we don't have soft tissue preserved. The rock type that they're in is wrong. Um, so for soft tissue, you want like a lithographic limestone, incredibly fine, grain size that gives you fine detail of the animal. With these things, we basically just find their bones in surrounding rock. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons why I'm pushing so hard to look at non-traditional places and new sites. Because one of these days, we will find the equivalent of these Chinese ash beds where these feathered dinosaurs are from for the Permian or the Triassic. And when that comes, you know, it'll answer all, basically all of our questions. Like a major thing, you saw that picture of the you know, the saber-toothed proto-mammal from Russia. So I, working with the artist who made that restoration, I advised him to put hair on it. But in truth, we do not know when hair evolved. So we know by the latest cynodonts, when they were evolving into mammals, they must have had fur. Um, and the early ones, like Demetrodon, almost certainly scaly. Where that transition happens in between, we do not know, and really won't know until we find soft tissue in the fossil record. Yes. Great talk, thank you. Oh, you I noticed that they had these animals had rather large fangs. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we associate herbivores with that not having such teeth structures. Why did they have the fangs? Were they left over from previous mm -hmm. creatures that just hadn't evolved away yet? So, with the the Dicynodonts, um, they're really more like tusks than fangs. And so they would have been used similar to how boars or even something like a hippo uses the tusks today, probably for doing a lot of rooting along the ground. So these animals would have been pulling up tubers. They would have been pulling up like rhizomes, uh, mushrooms, these sorts of things. Um, so the other one, the dinocephalian, those things really do have proper fangs. Um, but that does, that seems to be something retained from their carnivorous ancestors. And they were probably still using them uh, not for, you know, the catching prey, but actually probably for fighting with one another. So there are, you know, there are herbivorous mammals today. There's like the musk deer, there are various members of the pig family that have very fang-like structures. Um, and they use them for scrapping over territory or over mates. And the same thing was probably true of their pre-mammalian ancestors. Yeah. Hey, um, not being familiar with, uh, you, you made reference to the five largest extinctions. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly cover that, please? Yeah, so extinction is happening constantly. So 99.9% .9 of all life that has ever lived is extinct. With that said, there's a difference between background extinction and mass extinction. So background extinction is the extinction that is happening on any given you know set of few thousands of years where a pond dries up and a species of fish dies out, or you know, a new like type of weasel manages to jump over an island and find flightless birds there, and the flightless birds die out, that sort of thing. Mass extinctions are global in scope, and they involve the 
majority of life on Earth being in peril. And so we've, from looking at the fossil record, uh, life goes back a few billion years, but sort of complex life, animal life, is only around 500 million years old. So that's sort of our year zero for when we can recognize extinctions, because there's no way to tell like mass extinctions in bacteria in deep time. But we can tell, okay, trilobites, they're here and then they're gone. Um, and this has only happened five times. So um, three of those are in the Paleozoic. So you have one, um, one in the Ordovician, one in the Devonian, and then at the end of the Paleozoic era, the big one, which is the end Permian one. And then you have two in the Mesozoic at the end of the Triassic and then at the end of the Cretaceous. So things are very different in a mass extinction than in a background extinction. So animals, usually in background times, you expect sort of like very generalized creatures, sort of like rat-like things, that they're gonna be okay. They're always gonna make it through, but sort of and while they are more extinction resistant even in mass extinctions, in mass extinctions really all bets are off and you will see groups of animals that have been successful for 100 million years before then just you know, get unlucky and be wiped out. Um, so there's, there's real concern in that nowadays we are not yet in but maybe are entering the sixth mass extinction because we are seeing extinction rates ticking up more and more every year due to human activities on Earth. Uh, so there's a lot of debate among both conservationists and evolutionary biologists, sort of at what point do we really start to panic and say, okay, we're in a mass extinction. And in my mind, the answer to that is like, by the time we're able to say that, it'll be too late. And we need to assume that we're going into a mass extinction and take efforts to change this as quickly as possible without really waiting before 50% of species are gone. One, one small fact that you mentioned was that the sites in the southern Andes and South Africa uh, had similar kind of rock. Mm -hmm. Do you also find the same fossils within them? Very similar ones, yes. So when these proto-mammals were alive, it was, uh, the continental arrangement was Pangaea, so it's one supercontinent. Um, and so Patagonia and South Africa were very, very close to one another. And indeed, the, in some cases, we even do have the same species present um, in Antarctica, South America, and Southern Africa at the same time. So some, actually, some of these proto-mammals and the other reptiles that they coexisted with were the, some of the earliest support for continental drift. So before we even had any geological evidence that continents could drift, people um, in the 1930s and 40s saw, oh, wait, these two dysonodonts are present in basically every continent in the Triassic. How is that possible uh, unless those continents were actually a lot closer together? Why did the animals have such crazy names? Um, because people like me name them and we are crazy. Uh, so the, it is, uh, the scientific nomenclature of these things goes back to Linnaeus who in 1758 set the idea of using Latin names for these things because when you think about common names of what we call something, like what I call a mountain lion, someone else might call a cougar or a puma or a panther or a catamount or any of these things. And you go, say you go to another country and they're using an entire different language and you want to talk about some type of animal or some type of plant. So the scientific names ensure that we have a consistent means to talk about them worldwide. Um, so why do we use Latin? Well, not entirely. Uh, it's used traditionally because it's sort of a dead language so that people alive today uh, don't necessarily, you know, one language isn't favored over another. Uh, certainly the case to be made that even just by using sort of a classic uh, European language that you're adding a bias in that against say, like people who live in China, are they necessarily going to want to pronounce all these complicated Latin and Greek names? And indeed, a lot number of dinosaur species recently have uh, the names, the ones from China have started to be named in Chinese. Um, but they all mean something about the animal. So like Dicynodon uh, means two dog teeth because they have those big uh, sort of dog-like canines there. Or like Demetrodon means two measured teeth because it has teeth of two lengths throughout the length of the jaw. So you want it to be something that actually means something about the animal. 
Yeah. So you talked about how scarce, for example, Permian accessible Permian sites were and how eager you are to find other places that you can seek these kind of fossils. Talk about some of the techniques that you use to find other sites around the world. Yeah, so a lot of it just goes back to the geology and figuring out what age rocks are available. So like this site in Brazil that we were the first ones to really work in, um, we were the first people to do sort of dedicated paleontological excavations there, but the Brazilian Geological Survey had worked there as early as the 1940s and had figured out at that time that these were somewhere in the Permian or the Triassic. Um, so we spend you know, days and days poring over a lot of old geological maps because some of these places, you know, people haven't been uh, back to do sort of like fine scale stratigraphy and geology for 100 years in some, sometimes. Um, and try to find anything that's the right age that we want to look at and then figure out what type of rock it is. So in, first we only look at sedimentary rocks because if it's igneous, it's from a volcano, there's no fossils in that. If it's metamorphic, maybe there were fossils in it, but they've been pressurized into dust. Um, so we need sedimentary rock and we want land animals so we can tell what kind of rock can come from land. So you like a mudstone, a sandstone, those are good. Um, like as most shales, most limestones, those are from oceanic deposits. So that's probably not gonna have the proto mammals that we want. And so we narrow that down and uh, basically get sort of uh, some possibilities. And then there's all sorts of like political involvement that needs to be done in order to get permits or go to these places. Um, one great thing actually, so I said there isn't any technology that lets us just find a fossil in the ground, but satellite mapping and things like Google Earth have been an enormous help in finding exposed rock. So not, none of it is fine enough detail to show fossils, and indeed, like most of the time, a fossil at the surface, it's like this much. It's like a tip of a bone sticking out. Um, so it's very hard to see. But like in Brazil, we had a you know, we, got, we brought a sat phone with us basically just to get occasional access to Google Earth to look in the areas where we were, which was, you know, no, nobody had Wi-Fi there. <laughs> we're out in the jungle. Um, but by connecting with the satellite, we were able to see that actually just over a hillside, which we never would have tromped up through this dense forest otherwise, there was a vast amount of exposure through some gullies there. Um, and so we did go over there and actually found a lot of really nice fossil fish. Um, so yeah, there is, it is, is better, getting better and better in being able to pinpoint where the rock is. So raise your hand, let me know if you've got questions. I'm trying to look around, there's a couple, but as I make my way, so where are you headed next? Um, so I mean, next I will, I will be just back out uh, in Chatham County, helping to dig up this uh, dicynodont that we discovered out there. And we'll probably be out there whenever I can up until December. Uh, my, my next big uh, trip abroad is probably going to be uh, to China because they've collected a lot of these dicynodonts in the past few years. Last time I was there was 2007, and so there's been a lot of work done since then. Um, so I want to see both fossils that they've collected and maybe also get out and see some of, of the exposures and find some new ones. Do you go to many of the quarries around here? Was there a quarry near Sanford where they found quite a large uh, creature from that period? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's where the phytosaur was found, the big phytosaur. Um, so I showed the skull of one of these crocodile-like things, and yeah, that's from the Sanford quarry. Um, one quick question and then uh, you know, a little bit more involved one. Has, has the um, very um, destructive uh, mining in the Amazon um, using you know, lots of water mm -hmm. that bashes things, I guess this went on in California too, but anyway, um, in the Amazon, has that been useful um, perversely in uh, revealing um, rocks that would be helpful to you? No, um, strip, mi strip mining is always bad. Uh, so the reason, so historically, uh, mining was very useful to paleontologists. When you think of some of the, like, the most spectacular fossils of all time, like the dino bird Archaeopteryx, that was found by hand mining uh, the lime, lithographic limestones of Zollenhofen in Germany. Um, and that was because fossils, they're very fragile. So when it's just a, you know, a guy out there 
cracking a rock open, you can take the time and see, oh, wow, there's this thing in here. Um, so let's, and then send it to a scientist, and then they can go and find more. So nowadays, everything is mechanized, um, and there's basically no time to stop and check out what these things are. So the reason we've had so much success at our sites in this part of Brazil is because these are very, very rural, very poor areas, and it is, these are not, these are not areas where it's like there's not a corporation involved in the mining. They're not really supposed to be mining there at all. It's just local people out there where they know some rock is trying to get rocks to build their homes. Um, so they are doing this all by hand and leaving the spoil piles there uh, for us to then sort through. Um, so most of the, the major work being done, like looking for, for gold and things like that in the Amazon, is at a much, much larger scale. Um, there are a few cases where sort of large mining concerns have, have produced some, some pretty nice fossils. So in Alberta, there is an oil shale um, that they also is, is, they is done mechanically. Um, and they found what is actually the best preserved armored dinosaur, an ankylosaur that's ever been found there a couple of years ago, which was named last year as this animal Borealopelta. Um, and so that never would have been exposed if they hadn't been going through this oil shale. But even then, even in that case, uh, the backhoe tore off the tail and back legs of the skeleton before they saw, oh, wait, there's a cross section through an armored dinosaur here. And then scientists were able to come in and carefully collect it. So yeah, so large scale mining is, is really no one's friend in this case. Um, some small mining, though, is, is essential for paleontologists. Like, if there weren't brick quarries around here, we wouldn't see the local, uh, these local fossils. And so my other question, which I, I thought that one was just going to be yes or no, but anyway, um, is uh, besides identifying new species, do you try to figure out how widespread in the geography mm -hmm. they were present and how dense the populations were? within those ranges, uh, geographic ranges, yeah. and if so, how? Um, so because the record is so patchy, it's tough. Um, it's a lot easier as you get closer towards the recent. So people who work on Ice Age mammals, for instance, have a very, very good idea of like the exact ranges of things like giant ground sloths and woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, because there's so much of that Ice Age rock preserved at the surface that basically anywhere you go, any state in the US, you can find some Ice Age stuff. Um, and so if you find a mammoth tooth in there, yeah, mammoths were there. If you don't find mammoth teeth, well, the record is probably good enough that they probably really were absent. So in the Permian and in the Triassic, you can never really be sure that something really was gone. With that said, in terms of the populations, uh, yes, you can start to talk about that because there are much different sort of numbers of fossils at these sites. So if in one place you find 2,000 individuals of this disinodont, and then at another rock of the same age in a different area, and it has a different rock type around it, so you, that means it was a different environment, and then you only find four or five, that's really suggestive that something's going on. And if that pattern is repeated when you go to like a mudstone and there's only five, and then you go to a sandstone and there's 2,000 of them, that probably means, yes, these were animals living in sandy habitats and we're relying on them in order to live. So as you can assemble more and more of that data, you can start to say, uh, something about the paleobiology of these animals. But when you only have one specimen, as we do for a lot of extinct things, it's, it's questionable. So because political tensions between the US and some of the countries in which you're working uh -huh. are great now, talk a little bit about what the collaboration between you and your team and scientists from, say, Russia or China or some of these other places is like when you're out in the field. Do you have yeah. translators? Do you all speak? Numerous languages, what, what is it like? Um, I mean, I do speak multiple languages, but I don't speak Russian. And in, so in that case, uh, in that case, I was actually you relying on some existing tensions within the country. So I, uh, I collaborate with the group of people, of scientists who work out at this site. And then there's another group of scientists in Moscow, and they don't necessarily always see it eye to eye. Um, so in doing international collaborations, a lot of times there's some, some factionalization gets worked into there. So, you know, one international group might be working with these people and another with another people. Um, with that said, uh, in my travels, uh, I have found scientists and paleontologists, particularly abroad, to be 
very welcoming and very helpful, and we really do try to look for a, a global community of paleontologists to all help each other out. Um, there, is, there can be, in trying to get access to field sites, it can get dodgier just because then you're dealing with officials in the government and people involved in mineral rights. So for example, I was supposed to do a field trip to southern Madagascar once I started working in my PhD on these uh, proto-mammals found in the Triassic there. And as we were planning the, that field work, this was during a sapphire boom. Sapphires were discovered in the area. And all of a sudden, you know, guns trained on anyone who looked like they were slinging a pick down there, potentially stealing sapphires. Um, so paleontologists were sort of no longer welcome and we couldn't get permits from the government to do so. Um, but with that said, like e even throughout that, the paleontologists working in the country were super helpful and were, you know, very good about like getting specimens sent out and so we could prepare them in, you know, in the U.S. Uh, so yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's give and take as, as with all things, but I've had very good experiences with all my international collaborators. Thank you very much, Christian. Mm -hmm. Let's give him one more round of applause. Yeah, thank you all for coming out. I'll say thanks. Mammals then, mammals now, and international travel and, well, I was going to say intrigue, but not so much because it works out. There's been some intrigue. Okay, there's been some intrigue. Maybe another science guy. <laughs> <laughs> and bullet ants. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, anyway, did you enjoy the show? It's cool stuff, right? Your ancestors, you just met your ancestors, right? And they all hang out in the basement of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences now. So, hey, thanks for coming out to the Science Cafe tonight. Of course, next Thursday night is... It's Thanksgiving. Don't be here. We won't be here. Museum will be closed next Thursday. There's no Science Cafe next Thursday, just so you know, uh, because of the holiday. So I hope that you have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you in two weeks back here at the Science Cafe. Good night, everybody.